What's up? Good morning. I throw up my hands. Whew. I praise you again and again. Golly. First service, they did that song. Got me all messed up backstage. I swore I was going to get back there this time and things were going to be different. Guess what happened? God, it got me messed up all over again, man. Jeez. Y'all give it up for the worship team, man. Come on. Golly. Woo. What a morning. What a morning. Well, good morning. My name is Drew, and uh, I, I'm seriously so grateful to be here this morning to share with you guys as part of our, what we're calling our passion series, which is where we've asked different leaders in our church to come up and just share on a topic that they are really, really passionate about. And before I spill the beans and tell you what it is that I'm the most passionate about in the world, I'm gonna set it up with a little story, all right? Um, who else besides me when you were kids had your own little games that you made up that like only you knew the rules to? Like did anybody else have anything like that when they were a kid? Like you, only you knew the rules and like only you understood why this game was important to you? Well, I had this game that I liked to play and it didn't have a name, but the way the game went was my dad had this, and this was like in the late 80s, early 90s, all right, I'm like five or six years old. My dad had this really old brown corduroy chair. All right, I bet somebody in the room's like, I remember I had one of those. I remember those corduroy chairs. My dad had this old brown corduroy chair. And the really cool thing about this corduroy chair is that I could take my hand at six years old and I could slap that chair. And when I'd slap it, dust would come flying up out of the chair, all right? And it did not matter how many times I did this, there was always dust left in the chair, like no matter how many times I did this. And the, the glorious thing about it was the chair sat right in front of a window in our living room. So when I would smack the chair and the dust would come flying up, it would like trickle down in the majesty of the mid-afternoon sunshine. And it was like having a magic power at six years old. It's like, I see all these cartoons. I'm like, I got a magic power. I can slap this chair. I can make dust appear out of thin air anytime I want. You know what I mean? Like I felt like I had this magic power. Now usually, usually I would play this game when my dad was not in his chair, all right? That was sort of an important part of the game. But one day my dad decided that he was going to be in his chair while I felt the need to continue playing my game, okay? Now don't ask me how this happened because I, this is a parenting fail of some form. Somewhere I had gotten a knitting needle. Do y'all know what a knitting needle is? I don't know why a six-year-old would have one of these. But it's a needle about this long that you use to qu build quilts and blankets with. And I had this knitting needle and I figured out this really cool thing that if I take that needle, instead of using my hand, because the needle was so thin, when I would hit that chair, two really cool things would happen, all right? The first one that would happen is because the needle was so thin, it would create this nice concentrated plume of dust instead of this big one that my hand would make and would shoot up in the air. It was awesome, all right? The second cool thing that would happen is that needle, when it hit that corduroy, made the most satisfying flop you have ever heard in your whole life. I mean, the whole experience was just magical. I mean, it was everything to me at six years old. So my dad, my dad's sitting in his chair. I'm ready to play my game. I got my knitting needle. I walk over to my chair. I'm not sure my dad knew what was happening, but I took my needle and I raised it up, flop, hit the arm of that chair. And my dad said, okay, okay. You keep on, I'm gonna whoop your butt. Now, I need you to understand, to this point in my life, I had never been spanked before, ever. So there's no evidence to support that my dad's actually going to spank me, right? This is not, there's no evidence to support that this is actually gonna happen. So I get a second time, I pull my arm up, flop, come down, hit the arm of that chair. This time, my dad's tone changes a little bit in a way that I hadn't seen in a couple of years. He said, if you do that one more time, I'm going to, as we call it in the South, tear your butt up. That's what he told me, I'm gonna tear your butt up. I'd never heard him say this before, so the stakes are getting higher. So what do I do? Raise my arm up, and when I got to the top of my swing, 
and my little six-year-old brain had this, had this thought. I said, man, on the off chance, you know, that he's being serious, that he's going to spank me if I do this again, I better go all in, buddy. And I came down and swung as hard as I could, and in my excitement, I missed the arm of the chair and came clean across the, this part of my dad's leg. And two not cool things happened. Um, the first not cool thing that happened was there was no dust, and the sound was not nearly the sound was not nearly as satisfying. And the other not cool thing that happened was well. Let's just say I no longer have an interest in dusty chairs. Let's just say I've moved on from that phase of my life and uh, proceeded to get my first spanking ever, ever in my whole life. And as I think about that story, I can't help but think about, man, isn't it good that we can, like, grow? <laughs> like, isn't it good that we don't stay kids? Like, can you imagine running around your workplace with a bunch of people playing imaginary games? Like, it's a, it's a good thing that we grow up and that we have this ability to grow. And this is what I am most passionate about in life. It's personal development and personal growth. And the last few years have been crazy personal development years for me. But what I've learned to do through that process is I've learned to look at it through more of a spiritual lens. And so as we go through this morning, I'm gonna share a, a concept and a process with you that I've been applying to my life for a number of years that have transformed everything for me. But before I get to telling you that process, I want you to understand how I got to the point in my life where I knew that something had to change. Another way of putting it is the first time that my grown up life, you know, because when we're kids, it's like we got our parents, we got school, we got grandparents, everybody's forcing us to grow. But when you get older, man, you know, there becomes a new level of accountability that you have to take in that process. And I had not learned this lesson yet, but I was about to, because in 2020, everybody knows about 2020, in 2020 life, my grown up life gave me my first butt whooping, all right? And I want, to, I want to share quickly with you this story. Um, it was the story of my first panic attack, all right? I'm gonna be vulnerable up here today. I'm gonna share some things with y'all. It was the story of when I had my very first panic attack. So going into COVID, was, that season was, was unbelievably stressful for everybody. I, I understand that. My particular situation was, was such that my wife and I had some other things going on at that time. Um, I was having some unresolved health issues that I hadn't gotten to the bottom of. Um, I had been furloughed from my job because that was very common around the beginning of COVID. My wife was stuck in a very toxic work situation. Uh, I had some really scary family issues going on. Um, there, there were all these factors that were, that were just sitting there at the beginning of COVID. And then when, when COVID came along, it just sort of became this exponential factor that like poured gas on the fire of everything. I'm, I'm sure some of y'all felt the same way. And what ended up happening was I was sitting at my, my table the day that the panic attack happened and it was the middle of the day and I was sitting at home because I was furloughed from my job and I was reading articles online about COVID, which is a great thing to do when you have anxiety, right? Um, so I'm reading these articles, and you remember there was a period of time when everything was happening in the big cities before it would happen in the small towns. And so like going to the news source for the big cities was kind of your like litmus test for, for what was going to happen for us. So I remember reading this article, and it was about New York City, and in this article, it was like, uh, you know, it was talking about just hospitals full of people and, you know, hazmat suits. I mean, y'all remember, it was like something out of a movie. And this was one of those particular articles that had like the little contagion map, and you could like see where the contagion bubble was starting to grow outside of the city. And as I was sitting at the table, man, I could tell I was getting, you know, real, just real worked up. And... Uh, down at the bottom of the screen, you, you know the little section that says, here's some other articles that you might be interested in? There was a little article that was at the bottom, and it wasn't clickbait. It didn't need to be clickbait. And it simply said this. It said, President mandates shelter in place order. And I'm sure y'all remember this moment. Um, 
it was the moment when everything came undone for me. Um, everything that was going on, the stress of my life, the reality of what was about to happen, the gravity of what was coming, it all sank in on me at one time. And my wife was working from home as well at this time. So I got up from my kitchen table. And I was gonna walk down the hallway just to talk to her and let off some steam. And when I stood up from the table, I noticed that I felt like, like sort of like I couldn't get my breath like I wanted to. I just felt like I, like I couldn't get my breath. And by the time I got 20 feet down the hallway to her office, I had fallen over in the floor in my hallway and I was clenching and crying, sobbing, if you will, so hard that I literally blew the blood vessels out from my eyes all the way across to my ears. And I was laying on the floor, I was screaming, I was sobbing, I was gasping for air, I was shaking uncontrollably. I mean, it was the craziest thing. Like I had wrestled with anxiety my whole life, but I had never, ever experienced anything, anything even remotely close to that. And uh, you know, thank goodness those things come to pass, right? A few minutes went by and um, I found myself laying on the floor in my hallway and I sat up and I leaned against the wall in my hallway. And I remember like out of nowhere, these questions started going through my mind. And they're questions that I wonder if like at some point in your life, have you ever wondered the same thing? I started reflecting on what got me to this place. Like I knew COVID was a part of it, but that was only a part of it, right? And I started thinking, I'm like, man, what? What happened to my, like, how did my family situation get to this point? How did my financial situation get to this point? Like, how did my career, how did my health, like all these things just started racing through my mind. How did I get to this point? And as, as I sat there in my hallway, um, I didn't have any answers at all. I had nothing. But I knew, obviously, that I couldn't stay sitting on the floor in my hallway forever. So I did something that I don't normally do. And I got up, I walked into my living room, and I got my Bible, all right? I do normally get my Bible. I don't normally do the next part. I got my Bible, I sat down in my chair, and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm lost, man. <laughs> I obviously have no clue what I'm doing. And I'm gonna open this book, and I gotta trust that you are going to show me something that is exactly what I need to hear or read. And this is the verse that he gave me. It comes from the book of Acts. It says, then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from the darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So there's a whole lot going on in those verses, all right? There's a ton of context. There's a ton of, ton of everything but none of that mattered in that moment. What mattered in that moment is that the Lord was intent on getting my attention. And this verse, I'm gonna show you how he did it. The first thing that stood out to me about this verse was think about this is a man who's sitting on his floor looking for answers, right? And the very opening of this verse says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus. As if to reestablish himself with me that you know who I am. And I knew right off the bat, this is about to be painfully, painfully, painfully personal, whatever was about to happen here. Second thing that stood out to me was right after that, it said, now stand up and get on your feet. Now, I don't care what the context, the context is important. But in that moment, as a man who 11 minutes ago was sprawled out on his face in his hallway, to hear the Lord send you the words to say, stand up, get on your feet was exactly what I needed to hear in that moment. And the third thing that stood out to me comes from the very end of this verse. There's a word in here 
And that is what I would call uh, Christianese. Do y'all know what Christianese is? Like Christianese is like words that only like Christian people know. They're not like words that we would use in like real life. You know what I mean? They're not words that you hear people like talking about, you know, over nachos at Nueva Villa. You know what I mean? Like, like the, the word that came from this was sanctified. And it reminded me of when I had first started going to church when I was like 14 years old. And I remember I was sitting in this old country Southern Baptist church. Not there's anything wrong with that. I love the small country Baptist church. But I remember there was this preacher and he was preaching the most fiery sermon you have ever heard in your life on something called the benediction. All right, Christianese to me. And I just remember, <laughs> I remember sitting in that service and thinking to myself, the benediction, man, wow. You know, like I've never heard somebody like so passionate about a crummy way to cook eggs. You know what I mean? I was like, I was like, this doesn't, I don't understand why he's so fired up. It was Christianese. I didn't understand what he was talking about. So you can imagine when I got this word in this verse, I said, there's something to this word. And there's something that I need to know about this word. And I didn't know it at the time, but going on a quest to understand what the word sanctified or sanctification, as we're talking about this morning, when I went on a quest to understand what that meant, it ended up changing every single thing about my life. Now, if you're here and you don't speak Christianese, I want to take a second so that you don't get lost, so that you understand what sanctification means. Y'all ready? All right. So here's what sanctification means. Sanctification is the pursuit or the process, if you want to call it, of moving away from sin, okay, and towards the version of ourselves that God wants us to be, all right? It, it is a process of going from over here where sin is and constantly over and over and over again, separating ourselves from that and becoming more like the version of ourselves that God originally created us to be. Now in 2023 terms, all right, we might call this like personal development, personal growth, which I'm a big advocate of. But I wanna stress to you this morning that what I'm talking to you about this morning is not self-development for self-development's sake, okay? Self-development is good. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm a huge fan of it. But what we're talking about this morning is sanctification. It is a process of going from where you are to where God wants you to be. It's not the self-development tends to be the, more of the questions of what should I get? What should I have? What should I be? What should I learn? And sanctification is more of a process of saying, what does Jesus want me to have? What does Jesus want me to be? What does Jesus want me to learn? And I've got a visual representation for you so that we can sort of walk through what this looks like. Now, you've probably maybe seen a version of this before. This is my version of it. But in the self-development world, all right, this is what would be called a will of life, okay? And you'll notice right off the bat, Christ is right in the center, right? Christ is smack dab in the middle. And surrounding everything else are all the areas of your life that encompass like everything that you're going to do, be, experience, have, want, enjoy, whatever the case may be. So if you think about this like an actual wheel on a car, okay, the idea is to have a nice, y'all ever, y'all ever rid, driven on a flat tire before? Yeah, it happens. The, the idea here is you want to have a nice round wheel that goes smoothly down the highway of life, right? But here's what tends to happen, and this is why I want you to clearly see this distinction. What self-help does, and again, it's not bad, but self-help gives us the ability to pick an area of our lives and say, I want to grow in this. I want to learn more about this. I want to get more knowledge about this. I want to grow in this. And that's not a bad thing, but here's what can happen if that process is unchecked, all right? Gone unchecked, Let, let's say that you picked out your career. It was the thing that you wanted to chase down, right? And so now you're working 70, 80 hours a week, right? Your career little slice of the pie is gonna be looking pretty good. Even your financial slice of the pie is probably gonna be looking pretty good. But you've probably already figured out that's likely gonna come at the cost of fun and hobbies. It's likely going to come at the cost of health and physical. It's likely going to come at the cost of relationships and, and social interactions. And so self-development, while it's good, can take us 
too far out of line in one area of our lives. So on the other side of the token, what sanctification does, sanctification is constantly calling us back to the center to say, it's good that you want to work on you. It's good that you want to have goals. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you start asking the right questions of, of what is it in my life that separates me from sin and brings me closer to God, the balance of those two things creates this really nice round wheel where you can say, I'm putting God first. I'm, I'm taking the steps to separate myself from him and, or from sin and become closer to him. And at the same time, I'm learning new skills and things that are gonna allow me to continue to grow. But I want you to understand they, that they are two very different things. Now you're probably thinking, what does any of this have to do with me having a panic attack, all right? We gotta circle back, what does this have to do? The answer is, it has everything to do with me having a panic attack. Because when I sat down for myself and started to trace down the answers to those questions of, you know, what happened to my family? How did my finances get here? How did my health get here? How did my career get here? When I started chasing down the answers to those questions, what I quickly found for myself was that I had stopped growing towards Christ in most of the areas of my life. Now, what I want you to understand is this is exactly where the enemy, Christianese for the devil, wants you to be forever. All right, y'all have a good Sunday. I'll see y'all. Oh, <laughs> this is exactly where the enemy wants you to be forever. He does not want to see your family healed. He does not want to see your finances repaired. He does not want to see your family fixed. He doesn't want to see your career situation improved. He doesn't want to see any of those things. In fact, he would be thrilled if you would go to the complete opposite direction. That would bring a lot, of, a lot of happiness to him to see you fail miserably and go in the opposite direction. So I want you to understand, if you don't get anything else this morning, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. The enemy is not in the sanctification business. He is in the sabotage business, okay? The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy every good thing in your life. And guess what? He's really good at it, unfortunately. And so as we think about what that means, I want you to understand there are there are ways that he sabotages us, and they're obvious if you take time to think about them. So I want to share something. I'm going to be vulnerable for a minute, if that's okay with y'all. I'm going to share something that I really struggle with in my own life because I want you to be able to apply the reality of how this works, okay? So as I've been going through this process for myself, what I've come to conclude is that I need to lose weight and I need to take better care of my body, all right? It's hard to say when you're standing on stage in front of a bunch of people. But here's the truth of it, is I have, as going through this process I'm going to share with you, I've come to understand this is the next thing for me. But I want to, I tell you that because I want to show you how it is that the enemy tricks us, all right? Here's the first thing that he does. The first thing he does is he tricks you into believing that you're fine just the way you are. How dangerous is that when you really stop and think about it? Like, if, if left up to the enemy, I would just be a statistic. I would just be um, unhealthy, miserable, feeling bad about myself, and I would just accept that I'm overweight and that there's, it's okay. There's nothing that I need to do about it. There's no reason for me to go through a process of getting better because he knows there's nothing good for me there. There's nothing good for me with staying here, but he tricks us into believing that, right? The second, the second thing he does is he tricks you into believing that the things you haven't outgrown in your life only hurt you. And I can tell you definitively, there are so many things that I should show up for, that I want to show up for, that I want to be part of, and everybody thinks I'm this major extrovert. You have no idea how many things that I don't go to and I don't participate in because I hate the way I feel about myself. Even standing on this stage in front of you this morning, I feel like a total fraud and a total imposter. And 
to overcome that and to understand that's exactly how the enemy wants me to feel. And, he, and when you really look at that, what happens is that pours out and everybody that you don't show, everybody I don't show up for, everything I don't go to, everything I don't pursue ends up unknowingly hurting other people. It's not just confined to me. The third thing he does is he tricks you into thinking that there's going to be some magic moment in the future when it's all going to be okay. If, can anybody tell me when a diet starts? Tomorrow. Everybody knows that diets always start tomorrow. They never start today because today you got stuff going on, all right? Today you got stuff that, you know, you just need that big double tray. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just one of those days, all right? Everybody knows a diet always starts tomorrow. And guess what? The enemy will tomorrow me to death if I let him. I, he's been tomorrowing me for 20 years, but tomorrow, I know today I didn't get it right. It's only been 20 years, but tomorrow, tomorrow's the day, y'all. I got it all planned out. This is the trick. This is a trick. This is how it works. And the fourth thing he does is he tricks you into thinking that you can still find real peace and real joy in spite of these things. So think about this. I've I've achieved a, a decent amount of stuff in my life, okay? I, I'm proud of what I've accomplished. I, I have a lot of friends, I have a lot of things. But at the end of the day, when I go home at night, it's still there. It still permeates how I feel about myself. And it makes me think in the future, no matter how much I was to achieve or get or grow or have or do, that at the end of the day, man, that deep feeling of shame that I know I feel about myself, it permeates, man. It, does, it doesn't just go away. And the enemy would have you believe that it will, but in reality, man, it, if it was gonna work that way, it would already, would already happen. It just doesn't work that way. And the last thing, and I think the most dangerous thing of all, is he tricks you into thinking that you're too far gone and there is nothing that you can do about it. Now here's why I think that that is the most dangerous one of all. It takes the hope away. It takes the hope out of the equation. And it makes you think, you know what? Maybe there's some truth to that. I've been trying to lose weight for 20 years. Maybe, maybe I am too far gone. Maybe the, maybe the battle is lost for me. Maybe I should just give up. And if you allow him to, the enemy will keep you right there forever. Using one trick after another, after another, to keep you from ever making progress on the things in life that matter to you. Now, as I've been chasing this down in my own life, um, again, I've, I've come to realize that, that taking, care better, better, taking better care of my body and losing weight, without a doubt, is the next thing for me. And I'm gonna share a process with you that I promised you I would share from the beginning of how, how I go about this. But before I get there, I wanna share one last cool story with you um, that I, I got from a friend of mine a few weeks ago that perfectly ties in everything I'm talking about this morning, all right? So um, if anybody knows my buddy Cameron Price, Cameron Price, woo! So a few weeks ago, as part of my weight loss goals, I invited my buddy Cam to go to the gym. I asked, I didn't invite him, I asked him to go to the gym with me and show me around the, the weight room. Like, cause if you haven't lifted weights in a long time, man, it's really intimidating. Like you go in there, there's people like grunting, they're like wiping stuff off, it's weird, man. Um, I don't know what's going on. So I asked Cameron, I was like, Cameron, go to the gym with me, man. Show me, show, me about, show me some stuff about lifting weights. So we get in the gym and Cam starts pointing around. He's like, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. He said, but we're gonna start right here with the squat, all right? Because the squat is probably one of the more complicated movements that you can do in the gym. I was like, all right, I'm cool with that. So we get to the squat machine. And if you know Cameron, Cameron's like super detailed, which I love about him. And like, he will give you the finer details, man, which is, is how I operate, which is what I need. And so we get there and Cameron, Cameron starts talking. He's like, all right, first thing you gotta do, you gotta get your stance right, all right? Because everything about doing a squat all starts with getting your stance right, okay? That's what he was telling me. And he gets under the bar, he's like, he starts doing this. He's like, you gotta get your thumbs on these circles and you gotta have them pointing this way. You gotta hold the bar here. It's gotta sit on a certain part of your neck. You gotta have your feet a certain way, get the back neutral. You gotta keep the head up. I mean, it's like, he goes to this whole thing. Like, and I'm like, I'm like, Cam, is all this really that important? And like, he's under the bar, he's like, oh yeah. 
He's like, oh yeah, this is, he's like, this is the most important part. He was like, because unless you get your stance right, you won't be able to do the rest of the squat. And I was like, all right. So before I knew it, before I could even react, Cam busted out like an Olympic level squat. You know what I'm saying? And when he came back up, what I was shocked about was how far down he went in the squat. Like I was not, I had not like watched people squat competitively. So like I didn't know what was going on. And when he came up, I was like, bro, I was like, I gotta be honest with you. I don't think I can do that. He was like, what do you mean? I was like, bro, my, my knees don't go 90 degrees, bro. Like, that, that's not a thing, that's not a thing that's happening this morning. And he was like, well, he's like, well, you, you've got to because going, you know, going deep into the squat is where all of the, the work happens. And I was like, all right, I got this. Get out, I got Cam out of the way. I got under the bar, got my hands right, got my feet right, got my back right, got my neck right, got everything right, got the bar right. I'm under here and I'm ready, y'all. I'm about to make Cam proud. I'm about to do the, like, like the best like first squat he's ever seen. And I did something that looked a little bit like this. Y'all ready? <laughs> Just like that. And, I, and I, came, I came right back up and I was like, huh? I was like, how'd I do? And Cam, you know, being the encouraging friend, he was like, you know, man, I just want to applaud you because you showed up today, you know, you're at the gym. And so that's good that you're here, you know, we're learning. And he was like, he's like, I think we found, we're trying to go deep here. I think we found the problem. And the problem is, is that you got to work on hitting the box. And I was like, what are you talking about? So he goes over here and he grabs some little metal box, comes back, he sets it down in front of me. And he says, put the bar down put all that down. He said, all I want you to do is just focus on sitting down and hitting this box over and over again. I'm like, what you mean, man? And like, I got guys beside me with so much weight, like the bar is bending in half, you know, like grunting, they got the belts on. And Cam's like, I just want you to practice sitting, hitting the box. And I was like, I don't, I don't see how this is helpful. But he explained to me that until I could sit down and hit that box and stand back, did you hear my knees pop just then? He's like, until you can squat down and hit that box and stand back up, you're never going to be able to complete this squat. It's not going to happen. It is the next right thing to do. And until you do that and you can do it consistently, nothing else matters. And I tell you that because it frames up perfectly the process that I want to share with you this morning that pertains to sanctification. And the very first thing you have to understand about going through the process of sanctification is that you have to get your stance right, all right? You got to get your stance right. And what I mean by that is you need to understand growth is 100% your responsibility. If you're an adult, man, be one. Like people aren't, people aren't raising us anymore. Like it's our responsibility to grow as adults. Like somewhere in Christian culture, we subscribe to this messaging that, and again, I'm not talking about in self-help, I'm talking about in Christian culture, that if we just think about it hard enough, want it bad enough, or hope for it long enough, that, it, that Jesus will magically show up and make it happen. But it doesn't appear that that's how things work. In fact, if you look at the Bible, many times when Jesus met somebody in a, in a process of healing, you'll see clearly where there was an action on behalf of the other person before Jesus did what he was going to do. I mean, you read through the Bible, you'll see so many instances of army generals and armies who leave their whole armies and come to where, abandon their armies and come to where Jesus is to get in front of him and ask him for healing. You're talking about sick people that have dragged themselves across an entire city. There's stories of people getting lowered down through roofs. Somebody come to your house and bust a hole in your roof and start lowering people down. That's somebody who's serious about getting in front of Jesus. But this is the level of responsibility that people took to get this process complete. And I think about the story, if you've ever heard the story of the, the, the leper that was healed, there's lots of lepers that were healed in the Bible, but there's one particular instance of a leper that was healed. And what you need to understand about this story is that leprosy, you, I wouldn't have been Drew with leprosy, okay? I would have simply been a leper. All right? Like it is a disease that in that time, it defines who you were as a person. You can't work. You can't go to the temple. In fact, if you're even around other people that they have to be ceremoniously cleansed, not just a normal bath. They got to be ceremoniously cleansed before they could even go back into temple to worship. Like it was this terrible horrible, painful, unsightly disease. And it was so bad that if a leper was walking down the street towards you 
it was their civic duty to go unclean as you were walking towards them so that you would know to get on the other side of the street and not expose yourself to leprosy. But somehow, in spite of all that, in spite of, of this disease defining who this man was, in spite of all the social, the political, the religious, the economic standards of that time, this man took 100% responsibility to get himself in front of this man named Jesus. And when he did, God honored it so much. Jesus honored it so much. He reached his own hand out to a leper. That's unheard of. And it's a beautiful picture, I think, of what happens when we take responsibility to get ourselves in this process, to get, our, to get in front of Jesus. He will honor it, man, and he will reach his hand out to us, and he will help us. Now, the second thing, once you get your stance right, once you understand that this is 100% your responsibility, the next thing you have to do is you have to go deep. Just like Cameron told me in the squat, this ain't going to cut it right? You got to go deep because going deep is where the work happens. And what I mean by going deep is finding the problem and finding the next right thing that you can do about it. So when I talk about going deep, I'm not talking about the surface level stuff. I'm talking about really getting in there and figuring out what it is that's going on in your life. And if you're a follower of Jesus, there's this really cool tool that you have at your disposal. It comes from another Christianese word. Anybody ever heard of conviction? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of conviction before. Okay, so if you know what conviction is, conviction is like a, like a spiritual compass that is guiding you back towards the version of yourself that Jesus wants you to be. Like if you've ever been in a situation where you know there's something that you're about to do that you shouldn't do, or if you're in a situation that you know you shouldn't be in, and you feel that weight of that moment of like knowing this is a problem, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be here. Maybe as I'm talking this morning, you feel that weight on you of something in your life that you know is off. That's the power of conviction that's working inside of you to try and show you the, ne the area of your life that God wants you to work on, not you. And it's not bad to work on you, but conviction will take you right to the source of what it is that Jesus wants you to focus on. Now, once you go through that, you pay attention to your convictions, and you understand what it is that Jesus is, is trying to show you in your life, you have to find a next right thing that you can do about it. And this part is, this is the trickiest part, of the whole process, okay? Because what happens is we find, we'll identify a problem and then we'll find a next right step that doesn't make any, any real sense. It doesn't make any, like the, the next right step makes no sense. And we, because as people, we'll find any excuse not to do something, right? Like if we can find any reason to not do it, we will not do it. So I've come up with an acronym that I wanna share with you. And I've been using it, it's been helping a lot of people. But what this acronym does is it removes all of the excuses. Where if you find something that is a next right thing that meets these metrics, the only reason that you didn't do it is simply because you chose not to, all right? And I'm gonna share it with you through the lens of my struggle. So here it is, the, the acronym is SEARCH. So imagine like you're searching for a next step, all right? So the S stands for specific, all right? It has to be specific. You gotta call it very, very specifically. The E stands for evident, all right? Just means it has to be painfully obvious that this is the next thing for you to do. The A stands for actionable which means can you do it right now with what you already have? The R stands for realistic, meaning is this in the scope of something, what you're trying to do, is it realistically something that you could do? The C means consistent, which just means is it consistent with who you are? Is it asking you to step too far out of your comfort zone where you'll find a reason not to do it? It has to be consistent with who you are. And the H stands for holy which means does it honor God and is it good for your life? Now, let me give you a quick example of this. Let's say in my weight loss journey that I came to the conclusion that my next right step was to go to the gym every chance I get, right? Sound, sounds good on the surface, right? We go to the gym every chance I get. Okay, is that specific? 
I could have went to the gym between services. I could have went this morning. I can go after this service, and I can go again tonight and tomorrow morning because that's every chance I have to go. That's not, that's not specific enough. That's too many excuses for me not to do it. Is it evident? Is, is it painfully obvious if my goal is to lose weight that going to the gym every chance that I get is the answer? And it is not because it, anybody that lifts weights will tell you it all starts with your diet. So it's not painfully obvious that that's the next thing I need to do. Is it actionable? Um, no, because what is it? I, I don't have a workout regimen. I don't know. I still need to go many more trips with Cam. We didn't get through one whole workout. I don't have what I need to go and act on anything. Is it realistic? No, because I don't have time in my schedule. I don't even have a every chance I get right now. So it, there's no room in my calendar for me to even go to the gym. Ergo, it's not consistent with who I am because I'm not a person that likes to go to the gym. But you know what? It's holy. So that must mean it's the right thing to do. <laughs> wrong. There's so many excuses in there for me to never, ever go to the gyms. Way too complicated. Way too complicated. So let me tell you what I came up with. Instead, this is my actual next right step. I am going to the gym, but my next right step that I've searched out for myself is I'm going to track and eat 1,500 calories a day. That's it. Is that specific? Yeah specific 1500 calories every day is it obvious that that will help me lose weight yeah lots of blogs online tell me so is it actionable yeah I don't need to go get anything else or have anything else I have everything I need right now to do it is it realistic yes I can I, this is something that's realistically in my capacity to do is it consistent with who I am it is because I like to track things I like to measure things so it makes a lot of sense for who I am. And is it holy? Absolutely is holy. Because it's honoring to God, it's part of my sanctification process, and it's good for me. This has to be inexcusable. And if you can't come up with something that's your next step that meets all of these, throw it out. Throw it out and find something else because otherwise you leave any room on the table, you will find any excuse. That's just how we are as humans but then you take the power of the enemy wanting to sabotage us, this removes his ability to sabotage you because it leads the only excuse is that you didn't want to do it. There's no other excuse. Think about the power of that. God has shown you what it is you need to work on in your life and you have done the work of figuring out for yourself what is the most important thing you can honor him with in that. Woo! Isn't that cool? Isn't that crazy how that works? And once you get that part, this is the last part, is you got your stance right, you understand this is 100% your responsibility, you've gone deep, you've found an area of your life that you need to work on, you've done the work to find the next right step, the last thing you have to do, just like Cameron showed me, is you have to hit the box, which means doing the next right thing over and over and over again. Now, it's okay if you do other things too, but that is the most important thing because what, what the enemy wants you to believe is that it has to be more complicated than that, right? Like you get to a really simple, like eating 1500 calories a day is gonna change my life. And my human nature wants to go, that's way too simple, bro. There has to be something more complicated than, than that. Tell me what it is. I'll wait. What is there? What else can I do that's more important than that? God showed me the problem. I chased it down for something that makes sense to me, that's inexcusable. All I have to do now is hit that box over and over and over, because just like with a squat, until I can learn to hit that box and come back up, the rest of the squat, I'm, ne I'm never gonna be able to fulfill doing a squat until I learn to hit that box over and over and over again. And here, here's what I believe. I believe if you do this process enough times, you keep your stance right, you keep going deep, you keep paying attention to your convictions, keep looking at that chart, that will of life to the different areas that you might be struggling in, and you do the work to go deep and identify a step and execute on it over and over and over again, without even knowing it, you are going through the process of separating yourself from sin and becoming more and more and more the version of yourself that God created you to be. Now, this is what I wanna leave you with, is as I've been going through this process for myself, the Lord put something really powerful on my heart. 
a couple of months ago. And I wanna pose this question to you this morning. And it's simply this. When's the last time you really tried hard, man? When's the last time you, when's the last time you really gave it all that you had? Like when's the last time you really tried hard and went all in and said, you know what? I'm gonna fix my family. I don't care what it takes. I'm gonna lose this weight. I don't care what it takes. I'm gonna fix my finances. I don't care what it takes. When's the last time you really, really, really tried hard? When's the last time you got on your feet? When's the last time you stood up and said, I will do whatever it takes to get myself in front of Jesus so that he'll reach out his hand to me. And this morning, I want to remove any remaining excuses for you, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that somebody in here has the next right step of that they just need to come down and talk to me. Take all the excuses away for you because what's going to happen is I'm going to pray, I'm going to close the service, and I'm going to come stand right here, right here. And all you have to do is be willing to say, I know that there's something in my life that is way off, and I could really use some help finding out what my next step is. And I promise you, if there's any way that I can, I will do, I will do whatever I can to get in front of you and to meet with you and, and try to help you. Does that sound fair? Let's pray, close the service, I'll be right down here. God, we just thank you for a time that we can come together. And we thank you that there's no place for the enemy here, God. And we thank you that you're tearing down lies, God, and you're breaking down walls and you're making things clear. And we thank you that there's nowhere for us to hide from you, God. And we thank you that you want to meet us where we are and that you want to see us become the best that we can be, God, and to be as close to you as we possibly can. And Lord, I just pray boldness over this room. I pray that whoever you're speaking to this morning, God, I pray that you would pierce their heart to a point that they can't not come up here and talk to me, God. And even if they don't, Lord, I pray that they'll continue to keep their mind focused on you, to go deep, to pay attention to the things that you're showing us, God, and to help us find out what we can do about it, Lord. I lift this time up to you, and I pray, and I just thank you for a place for us to be together, to be raw, and to be honest. It's in your name we pray, God. Amen. Y'all have a good week.